Most of you here know Kevin East, but for out of, our, our out of town guests, you know, I really wanted to let everyone get to see our East Texas communities and what Tyler is really all about. I couldn't think of a better person than uh, having Kevin East come deliver that message. Kevin is the president and CEO of the Mentoring Alliance, a Christ-centered, intentionally multi-ethnical ministry serving thousands of kids and families in Central and East Texas. Kevin Front comes from an extensive background of ministry strategy, staff leadership, and community engagement. During many of those years, he was the executive director of ministries at Pine Cove, overseeing all the camp's uh, activities. Kevin is a dynamic communicator, having spoken at various events on issues about biblical truth and godly parenting. He is also currently speaking on the speaker team of Family Matters and speaks at events each year, grace-based parenting. Kevin and his wife, Stephanie, are proud parents of five children. His boys and father are with him here today. Two of his children began as foster children and they were able to adopt them in the fall of 2012. Stephanie and Kevin share a strong passion for families living out the mission of God. They've done this through fostering, mentoring children, opening their homes to those who have needed a safe place full of godly love, security, and healing. Kevin's a dear friend of mine. Please help me welcome Kevin East. Thank you, Bill. Man, you like read like my whole biography type thing or something. That was awesome. Hey, Bill hates public speaking. Didn't he do great? Way to go, Bill. Hey, uh, I don't know if all of y'all know me. I know I live here in Tyler with a lot of y'all. I know some of y'all are here from out of town. Um, so as Bill just read my whole autobiography about me, that, that's me basically in a nutshell. I have to tell you um, what's obvious about me speaking at this event. If you got the list of former speakers there in front of you, like when they sent it to me, um, it's kind of weird, let's be honest, right? Some notable names that I looked at when I, when I saw the list they gave me were people like Nolan Ryan, Paul Harvey, Judge Ken Starr, Lyndon Johnson, Ronald Reagan spoke at this event. Head football coaches in major colleges, world record holders, Nobel Peace Prize winners, multiple governors who are now presidents, professional athletes, and astronauts. I mean, people who could come in here and say, hey, I went and touched the moon, and I'm here to tell you about it. I have two words to explain me speaking this year, and I think it's budget cuts, okay? <laughs> this does not make sense to you, it does not make sense to me, but let's, let's bear with it together, okay? Hey, uh, here's the thing, in case you don't know me, um, as, as Bill already said, I get to, to lead an organization here in town um, called Mentoring Alliance, I'll mention it here towards the end of my time with you all today here. Um, at this luncheon in the past, you've heard from great people, like I said. Um, you've heard from governors, now presidents. Um, but I want to talk to you about kings today. Kings is not something we're totally familiar with as Americans, right? We fought a king to become Americans, right? But I, I think we can learn from some kings. But before we look at some kings, I want to kind of set the stage for you. And for those of y'all who know me, um, you're very well familiar with this. Uh, I went to my, uh, some doctor friends at church the beginning of 2020, and I got very technical with them. I said, hey, uh, Dr. Craig Radford, Dr. Warren Obermite, I'm having trouble pooping. Can we talk about that? I bet nobody's ever said that from this stage, huh? Is that, is that a first? Yes. I said, can we talk about that? And they said, hey, how about we uh, do a colonoscopy? And I was like, no, no thanks. And he's like, man, we put you under for that. And I said, well, I could probably muster up the energy to do that. So I went, and uh, there's my wife and I sitting uh, in the waiting room, um, to have a colonoscopy in the summer of 2020. And January is when I brought it up, but this little thing called COVID pushed back elective procedures for me until June the 15th. So we went to the, uh, the colonoscopy and I came out finding that I had stage 3B colorectal cancer, or as we like to call it, cancer of the A money money. And that began a journey for me. Some of y'all might have had cancer. Maybe you have people that you know who've lived or died of cancer. Um, at the time, I was 46, and I was like, this, this is not supposed to be this way. Um, one of the hardest times over that process was coming home to tell my boys that I had cancer because they had watched their father-in-law, my father-in-law, one of their granddads, die of cancer five years ago. 
It was a hard conversation on the front porch with a lot of tears. Like, I don't know what this means, right? I just know I have cancer. I know it's in me, and I know it's not in a fun place to talk about. And we began a process. I began to go to this chair. Um, Y'all may have heard or met other people. You sit in a chair, the dreaded green chair, um, every other Wednesday through 12 rounds of chemo. Um, sitting with people that I felt like, you know, in a room where they would cover you with a white sheet because it's cold in this room. And, and in my mind, I'm not taking the white sheet, I said to myself. Because it looks like a morgue in here. And I don't care if I'm uncomfortable, I'm not putting the white sheet on me. But sitting in this chair, if somebody took a picture of me one day through a window as they walked past this chemo room, I would get dressed and like in business casual, I'll call it, because I'm going to work in my mind. I've got to go get some chemo. I've got to get some medicine for my body. And I would sit in this chair for five hours. And over a period of sitting there, your mind wanders, as you can imagine. Like, Lord, what's going on? Lord, am I going to live six months, a year, you know? I don't know. And you begin to evaluate your life. I don't know that we have many opportunities where six or seven hundred men can sit in the same room and just kind of be candid for a minute and go, what if we actually spent a few minutes today actually evaluating our life together? What if we put pause, press pause on a busy day of stuff today, maybe a full weekend, whatever it is, we said, you know, we're going to actually just stop and we're going to contemplate a little bit. I've been doing a lot of that over the past year and a half. So there I'd sit in that chair getting chemo. I'd leave, they'd attach your pump in what's called a metaport, this cool little thing I still have in my chest. They attach this pump that you wear in a fanny pack for 48 hours, it pumps more chemo into you, which feels really good. And so I had to make it a challenge. So I get home, I grab my buddy John. I said, how about we run six miles, right? We've been running through COVID and all this type of stuff. I've got to keep running. So we ran. I, in fact, I had a bunch of pictures of us running in here. I'm like, okay, enough of the running pictures. So I cut them all out except for this one. But, but my goal that I started at the beginning of cancer is I'm going to keep running six miles every other day and on every pump day, which is every other Thursday where the pump's attached to my chest. And in my mind, it was my way of telling me I'm still alive. I'm going to run with a pump on my back connected to my chest. I'm going to run. And candidly, what was going through my heart and mind, guys, was this, like, Lord, let me live. Let me live because I'm not done yet with my own family. In my mind, I'm not done. And so I'd run. We ran, we ran, we ran. Went through 12 rounds of chemo, 28 treatments of radiation. I kept running until day 13 of radiation. I just couldn't do it anymore, guys. When your rear gets sunburnt that bad that many times, it's like, this is not a good thing, right? Two surgeries. And this past, uh, whatever it was, June, they told me that I was in complete remission, which sounds like intermission to me, so I don't like that word. I want them to say you're cancer-free, but I guess you don't say that for a few years about cancer. Had a colonoscopy this past Monday. It was clear. Praise God for that. I'm very grateful. But it was a long time. I got to ring a bell like many people get to do at the end of cancer treatment. I got to stand there and go, this is so weird. I've seen people do this, and here I am. I would never wish it on any of you men in this room, but you don't know if you'll be in a similar spot in the future. So today we contemplate, right? I went home after treatment. I looked above my fireplace, and I saw this picture We've had this verse above our fireplace for years, and it says this, Oh God, from my youth you have taught me, and I still proclaim your wondrous deeds. So even to old age and gray hairs, oh God, do not forsake me until I proclaim your might to the next generation, your power to all those to come. And I was like, you know what, Lord? I'm still alive. So Lord, let me grow old with gray hairs, and let me continue to proclaim what you've done in my life, even to my own kids here. It gave me purpose. It gave me a reason for living. And so I have to tell us, for all of us, I want to ask you the question today to contemplate. I want to talk about kings. Like I said, you're used to governors, presidents, but kings. You know, in the Bible, two-thirds of the Old Testament of the Bible is either written by a king, about a king, or because of a king. Two-thirds of the entire Old Testament of the Bible. Kings played a major role throughout biblical history. You know, there's 43 kings... Of those 43 kings, all but eight of them were considered bad kings. Eight were good. 43 minus eight were bad. Yet they were almost all terrible fathers. What were they doing? They were building kingdoms. Keep in mind, these men were powerful men of their day, right? 
They had everything about wealth, about beauty, about power, about fame. They had it all. Thousands of years later, we still crave what they had back then. But listen to some of these kings, just four of them. Jeroboam was a control freak. As a result, he lost his legacy and his kingdom. A king named Amaziah started out on a good path, but he couldn't handle godly input and counsel. So he died a sick and bitter old man. King Ahab rebelled against God and married the wrong woman, the wicked Jezebel. Then he punted his leadership to her, sealing his own fate and the fate of his children. Jehoshaphat was an impulsive short-term decision maker. He gave his son in his short-term decision in marriage to a terrible woman. And that impulsive short-term decision brought grief, violence, and murder for his family for generations. Kings. And you might be thinking, what does this have to do with me? You and I might not be kings, but you know what? God has designated us as the king of our homes, whether we like it or not. And one day our sons will step up to the throne and carry on the family heritage. And the decisions we make as men today will affect generations. Fathering and grandfathering is about mentoring. It's about equipping our sons to become men who will assume the family leadership for the future. We have no higher calling as men. So we sit in here today, some as future fathers, some as current fathers, some as grandfathers. Men of influence. These men had it all. They were told three simple instructions when they became kings. In Deuteronomy chapter 17, we're told there are three instructions. You're not to multiply horses for yourself. You're not to multiply wives for yourself. You're not to greatly increase silver or gold for yourself. In other words, don't focus all your time and energy on stuff. Don't focus all your time and energy on women. And don't focus all your time, or, 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 all your time and energy on money, in a sense. That was their instruction. But generally speaking, these kings bankrupted their souls instead of loving the Lord. They washed over their real estate, their palaces, their armies, and their accounts receivable. But you know what they didn't do? They ended up building kingdoms instead of building future kings. That's how they spent their time. So when I think about my own sons, two of my sons are here, Walker and Levi, would y'all stand up over there real quick? Two of my sons, the third one, one's at cross country. That's my oldest son, Walker, my youngest son, Levi. My youngest son, Levi's middle name is Kevin, because I think he looks like me, let's be real. So uh, he has my middle name. Thank you guys, you can sit down now. I want to teach those boys and my other son and my daughters about a God who loves them. I want to teach them about who they are. I want to teach them about walking with God personally. And I want to teach them about God using them to make a great impact on this earth. And then someday I'm going to launch them out to lead families of their own. So to me, time well spent today is building future kings and Walker and Levi and my other son Miller and future queens and my daughter Hannah and Madri. So how about we uh, ask this question today as men? Are we busy spending all of our time, all of our energy, all of our passions building a current kingdom? Or are we prioritizing with our time and our energy and our passions building and raising up future kings and queens in our own family? That's what I'd ask you to contemplate today. You know, my dad is right over there. He drove him down. You want to stand up real quick? Come on, dad. I know you want the attention. Go ahead and stand up. Yeah, there he is. quick sidebar about my dad. My dad's a, a long-time, lifelong Alabama fan. And I mean, such an Alabama fan, he has not seen them lose like in 30 years. Like he only, he records the games and he only watches them if they win. And then he had the bright idea last weekend to go to Kyle Field to watch the game in person. <laughs> I'm so sorry, dad. My dad's a retired FBI agent, Agent 455, as he was known for many years. Uh, he's been retired and lives in the Dallas area now with my mom. My dad would never tell you this. He would never have explained it this way. But in many ways in our own home, my dad was busy building future kings and queens. When I was a kid, maybe you do this in your house, we had like a, a rectangular or oval table growing up. We go to the dinner table and there was a, always a chair my dad sits in which of course then I wanted to sit in that chair and so I'd try to get in his chair and he would like wrestle me out and he'd throw me down and he'd be like, this is the king's chair, right? I'm like, okay, got it, dad, whatever, you know, we keep going. I ended up building my first house here in Tyler 25 years ago and my parents came to visit and I had a square table. You know, where does the, where does the king sit at that table? 
And we were sitting down to eat one time, and they were kind of just staying there like they were lost, like not knowing where to go. And I said, hey, y'all sit down. I said, oh, by the way, yeah, this, this is my chair. It, it's the king's chair. And my dad says, I know, I left it open for you. Are we busy building current kingdoms? Are we as men busy building current kingdoms or building and raising up future kings and queens? It's a question we have to ask ourselves today. When I think about wanting to build and raise up future kings and queens, there's a few shifts in my mind I want to help them make. Let me explain them to you. I want to help them make the shift growing up in our home from foolishness to wisdom. Now look, I was a nefarious kid growing up. I got to be honest with you. I did all sorts of crazy things. I got in trouble, got sent to the principal. I, I rolled a house. The first house I rolled with toilet paper, I had the brilliant idea to roll the house two doors down from my own. So when my neighbor came out, she saw me. I'm holding a roll of toilet paper, like connected to her whole yard. And she's like, Kevin? And I was like, yes, ma'am. <laughs> I mean, like ignorant. Then I go to college and I have a bright idea in college that, you know what? I, I, I panic on a final exam in an advanced experimental statistical psychology class. So what do you do? I did what I've been doing off and on since seventh grade. I cheated. Except this time I got caught. I got sent to the dean of students at LSU. I was told that I would fail the course and potentially be expelled from the university. I ended up not getting expelled, by the way, but I did fail the course. And oh, by the way, that professor on the first day of the next semester said, I hate cheaters. And in fact, there's one in this room today and y'all, I'm telling you, I thought, if he points me out, I'm going to take my chair and jab it through his temple. Like, I, that was going through my mind. I probably shouldn't have told you all that. But here's what I remember about that happening, though. I remember I find out I failed, you know, I failed this course. I got caught cheating on tests. I panic. I go home to my apartment. I have to call my parents and tell them, which was incredibly embarrassing. You know what I remember about their response? I couldn't tell you anything they said on the phone. But I remember my apartment that night. They showed up to my apartment with a plate of spaghetti. And I remember my dad told me he loved me. You know what he was doing? He was preparing me, helping me understand and walk through discipline as a kid, through consequences as an older kid, from foolishness to wisdom. We know the Bible says in Proverbs 9, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. It begins with that. So we want to be men who raise up our kids and say, we want you to know who he is. We want you to know this God that we know. The second shift I want to help our kids make that we as men can help our kids make is from self-centeredness to self-discipline. Did you know in the 90s, well-meaning parents, I'm sure you've heard the term, well-meaning parents who hovered, remember what they were called? Helicopter parents. They would hover over their kids. Well, oftentimes parents today are referred to now as what's called lawnmower parents. And the idea about lawnmower parents is that you and I are tempted quite often to basically go out in front of our kids and knock down everything in their way to make sure the path is clean and clear and smooth so they can kind of come and walk up behind them. I can't imagine Dr. Crawford, a superintendent here in town, you know, I'm sure you get to, or your people get to talk to all sorts of parents who are like, I don't want this happening to Mike, as opposed to saying, you know what, this happened, there's a consequence. If we're trying to get them from self-centeredness to self-discipline, then we want them to learn these things. I was having a conversation with my oldest boy the other day. Hey, look, if you hit your alarm clock off as many times as you have been, you will start missing school. And you're going to have to figure that out. We want to help our kids move from self-centeredness to self-discipline. We want them to understand the significance of delayed gratification, of waiting for sexual desires to be fulfilled in the appropriate times, in the appropriate context of the covenant. We want them to understand the delayed gratification when it comes to material possessions. Of, you know, don't spend yourself where you have nothing and nothing and nothing. Like, understand self-discipline and what that looks like. It's a simple shift. Another one is this. From pride to humility. It goes from saying, I have to be first in line to I want to be last. I want to let people go before me. I want to consider other people's needs before my own. You know, my dad, I mentioned, was, a, was an FBI agent. He wouldn't have told you, like I said, he was trying to build future kings or queens. But he was an agent uh, level 13. GS 13, I think is what it's called. He had moved around a lot as a kid with his family, and to him it was really important to keep his family in one place, that he would look to others' needs before his own. So when he got to SA-13, a GS-13, and the FBI is a special agent, he said, you know what, I don't want to go any further. 
I don't want to become one of the guys you see on the news, SAC, a special agent in charge in a community because I know I'll have to move my family around a lot. So he denied himself for the benefit of others. He wouldn't have told you he was raising future kings, but we were watching. From pride to humility, they were willing to sacrifice. Next, from selfishness to generosity. It's the idea as opposed to hoarding that we look to be eager to give. We were at a restaurant the other night. We had this awesome woman serving us at our family. There's this great Cajun restaurant that we really like. And my kids, they just loved her. And they're all talking at the end. Dad, can I fill in? My son was disappointed because um, I thought we were tipping really big. He's like, Dad, you got to do way better than that. And he's like, can I fill in $40 more of my own? $46 more, I think it was my own money. Another son said, Dad, can I fill in $16 more? I was like, yes, you're starting to get it from... from from scarcity, from selfishness, from just hoarding to the idea of generosity. We want to build these into our kids. This doesn't just happen by watching. It happens from intentionality. We want to build that into our kids. And lastly, or here's a great verse to back it. The Apostle Paul is teaching a young pastor in the New Testament. And he says this, As for the rich in this present age, y'all recognize that's us, right? Myself included. We know where dinner's going to come from tonight. So on a global scale, we're rich. And he says to this pastor in the Bible, as to the rich in this present age, charge them not to be haughty, don't be prideful, nor to set their hopes on the uncertainty of riches, but on God, who richly provides us with everything to enjoy. They are to do good, to be rich in good works, and to be generous, ready to share. We want to build up kings and queens that are generous. And then lastly, from fear to faith, I had to come to grips with myself during cancer that, you know what, maybe what my kids need to see is what it looks like to die while filled with faith. At some point, we will all die. Maybe this will happen sooner than I expected. So Lord, let me show them what it looks like to die full of faith. My oldest son just turned 16. We gave him a machete for his birthday because... Seemed like the right thing to do. I mean, a machete? Seriously, that's kind of cool. I bought my boys these machetes 15 years ago, waiting for this birthday. Presented it to them. It's a pretty cool machete, if I must say so myself. But we're having a verse written on the sheath, the leather sheath, and it says this. It's out of Jeremiah 9. It says this, Thus says the Lord, Let not a wise man boast of his wisdom. Let not, let not the mighty man boast of his might. And let not the rich man boast of his riches, but let him who boasts, boast in this, that he understands and knows me, that I am the Lord who exercises loving kindness, justice, and righteousness on the earth, for I delight in these things, declares the Lord. Lord, let my boys and my daughters be men and women full of faith as they grow up, not held captive by fear, but full of faith in you. You know what a couple of examples this looked like for us, for former speakers here? Years and years ago, there's a speaker, I'm not going to give her their name, This person was powerful, spoke at this luncheon. This person was wealthy with a lot of zeros. This person got married, he was a titan of business. He was committed to building a kingdom, a current kingdom. He got married a few years later, got divorced, married again, 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 and a few years later, got divorced, and married again, and then a few years later, got divorced. Some of his kids were in jail. Some were addicted to drugs. Some claimed abuse by their dad. Others claimed that their dad was trying to wreck their business they had started. Building a current kingdom. Now my dad will appreciate this one, but there was a different speaker here, 2002. And after reciting his impressive accomplishments, you might be surprised to learn of what he would consider his greatest accomplishment in life. In 2002, this luncheon was packed to hear from none other than Coach Gene Stallings. He played college football at A&M in the mid-50s. He graduated with a bachelor's degree in physical education. Soon married his high school sweetheart, Ruth Ann Jack, who was the homecoming queen at Paris High School. Stallings was the protege of Coach Paul Bear Bryant. Many of y'all know that. Played football under him at Texas A&M. Then he went and coached with him at Alabama. Gene Stallings went and coached in the NFL. 
By the way, he became the head coach at Texas A&M at the age of 29, eight years after graduating college. That's crazy to me. Spent all his years coaching. He had one son and four daughters. His son had Down syndrome and had a congenital heart defect. His name was John Mark. He went by, went by Johnny. They co wrote a book together about their relationship. Coach Stallings acknowledged the obvious that Johnny's courage and attitude had a positive impact on everyone he met. And more personally, Johnny's life deeply affected the, the way his father coached because he appreciated people who things didn't come easily to them. Just outside Bryant-Denny Stadium at the University of Alabama, there's a statue of Coach Gene Stallings in the Walk of Champions along with the statues of the four other national championship winning coaches there. But I believe if you were to ask Coach Stallings which statue he's most proud of, get this, it's not any of those. It's not that one, that is. The statue is at Faulkner University near, in nearby Montgomery. You'll find a statue of Gene and Johnny Stallings there. There's a picture of him and his son now. But right outside the stadium, there's this statue of Coach Stallings and his son, Johnny. The statue of father and son together represents Coach Stallings' lasting legacy. And that's what he's most proud of. You see a man, a coach, a husband, a dad, who's building future kings and queens. Man, let us be inspired by that today. I got to tell you, it's no secret, Dr. Crawford and I were talking years ago in every community, and we're no different. There are all sorts of kids and families that come from all different types of unique backgrounds. I was one of those kids that benefited from multiple mentors growing up. Dr. Crawford and I were talking years ago, I said, man, we've got to do more for kids in this community. We've we have after-school programs as part of Mentoring Alliance. We've got to do more. What if we started summer camps? And what if we started those summer camps in schools? Maybe you've seen it on the news. We had an organization in Wisconsin a little bit mad about that recently. But what if we did some summer camps in schools? I said, but Dr. Crawford, if we did it, we need some help. We need schools. We need buses to help get kids to these schools. We need to get food and meals provided for these kids. But most importantly, we've got to get teachers involved with these kids. Six or seven years later, here we are, and what started off with a simple conversation with Dr. Crawford and I, there are thousands of kids now each summer, Tyler, and Tyler now in a White House, and now we've just expanded to Waco as well, where we're providing great godly people to have these phenomenal summer camp experience for kids in our community, and we're sneaking in right in the middle of it, summer camp, summer school that is. Because what we want to do is we want to provide mentors to other kids and families in this community as well. There are some people here, I already said hi to some of them here in the back of the room, that are, uh, you know, like heroes in my mind here in this community. These people are, some have been mentoring for years. I just got to meet some of their mentees. We have hundreds of people now have stepped up to this community saying, Lord, how else can you use me? So we've been connecting godly people as mentors with kids and families in this community. We have people like Alex and Marshall here. That, uh, that have been mentoring and menteeing together. Jason White, Pastor of Colonial Hills, I saw him back over there with his mentee, J.K. Jason, where are you? And J.K., where are you? There's Jason. J.K., JK stand up. J.K., I told him a second ago. Yeah, give him a round of applause. I told J.K., I said, man, I, you're like a famous dude. He said, I'm also a, a famous gospel singer. I was like, well, I'm glad to know you. So, J.K., thanks for being here today. You have uh, people like Delwin and Zach, been mentoring in this community for years. Uh, people of old, like Steve Smith, eight maybe years ago, was matched with a young boy in this community named Matthew. And if you know Steve Smith, you've seen pictures of Matthew all over. Here he is in the band there at Tyler High recently. Steve Smith, man, he's writing recommendation letters to get him jobs and connecting to people. It's, it's just neat to see that long time relationship there. When the chairman of our school board says, hey, don't leave me out. I have something to offer. I want to help raise and build future kings in this community. There's Wayne being, uh, Wade being matched with his mentee, Jermaine. Wade, thanks for being here today. And Jermaine, you want to give up for Jermaine back over there as well? Yes, Jermaine. I mean, I love when Wade says, hey, I can, I can mentor. Hey, come on, Jermaine, come on a family vacation with us. I'm like, I just love it. It's an example of people living for something more than just what today has to offer. People like Matt Edwards here in this community that years and years ago, Jerron might be surprised to see this picture in the bottom right-hand corner of that picture is Jerron. Fast forward years later, Jerron's in high school. Years later, Jerron graduates high school. Jerron, would you stand up back over there, my friend? Jerron Wise. There he is. 
I love it. So all to say for us, men, there's examples of people living beyond themselves here in this community. Going through cancer, talking about my A-money money with anybody around for the last year and a half, it's not awkward for me anymore. It's actually probably going make you awkward because it's not awkward for me. But my takeaway from this whole experience for me has been this, is that these people right here in this picture, I will have the greatest impact on this earth by these people in this picture right here. So this has been a season for me of renewing my mind to, Lord, let me not be focused solely on building a current kingdom, but I'm building and raising up future kings and queens. And I would challenge all of you as men today to leave this luncheon contemplating. Where's your focus? And does it need to be adjusted as you leave here today? Let me pray for us all if I could, and then we'll be done. Lord Jesus, thank you for this time with these men that they're willing to sit here and listen to somebody who's not an astronaut and not a governor and not a president, certainly not a Nobel Peace Prize winner. But Lord, I pray that as we even looked in your word, example of these kings and considered our own lives, that Lord, that we might leave here all thinking and contemplating and considering where our focus lies right now. And Father, I pray that as we as men, that our words and our actions would be used to build and not destroy. So Father, today I pray, I, I, I pray a blessing over these men, Lord. They would walk with you and know you. And as a result, man, they would bless and build many men and women around them. I pray this together, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen.